thank you, Jess. Uh, thank you also to Duck Creek Farms and Jess Frost and her team for all of the support and the invitation to come out on here. Also, I'd like to take a little moment to thank uh, Bill and Christina of Peconic Pictures for that wonderful video that they did. Um, and Sarah as well, installing next to her has been such a wonderful Latina-infused experience as we uh, show together in this space. I wanted to start over here just with this installation that we have. I, the first when I came into Duck Creek, I was so excited to see the wooden walls, but also these little moments, uh, these little shelves and areas to have these kind of installation areas that will remind me of what uh, the work is really about. This is a series in Casa that's all about my work over the past few years that all explore the New Yorican interior, really thinking about the Puerto Rican diaspora in New York and how it's influenced by the Caribbean, by the urban environment with its in, and how you kind of can control and, and hold on to that memory. In here, we have little moments of, of things like that, a sign that I had growing up. My father made street signs as his job and how he held us down for all those years and photos of family and musical instruments and so on. A little bit of something to get you to feel like home, which is what the whole purpose of the work is. Um, as I first going on to the first piece as you come into the work is called Wandering Roots. It's basically this idea that started during the pandemic of how I could only see inward into other people's apartments or outward through my own windows. And, and thinking about these windows almost as of the eyes into the home and, and the home as almost a portrait of a, of a human, what you can tell from somebody's interior spaces. So I was thinking then of like my grandmother, my titi's apartment and looking out, even thinking about Queens homes where the houses are right next to each other. And although maybe in Puerto Rico, you'd be able to look out and see nature, but here maybe only a brick wall but how you have to then internalize that nature and kind of bring that into your house. And however way you can do it, maybe it's some plastic flowers, <laughs> maybe it's some root vegetables that you're hanging, but you're still this combination of being both this like Latinx experience, being American and coming from somewhere else, thinking about like the, wonder, the wandering roots is the wander bread in here, or wonder bread, this good old classic Americana. That idea continues when we're thinking about even like our connection with sugar and soda. Although good and bad experience, Puerto Rico has a very long history with working in sugar fields and, and thinking about sugar cane, but also these issues with diabetes and so on. And yet for me, I have these also nostalgic feelings of like drinking so much soda that I definitely <laughs> should have not been drinking, um, making sure that we always had enough. This piece is called Fill to the Rim. We would fill up our soda all the way to the top of the cup to make sure we had enough to go all the way to our room and not run out. <laughs> but I call it coqui cola instead of Coca-Cola as a sort of an idea of, of referencing, thinking of the coqui, which is the Puerto Rican popular frog that's over there, thinking about ways in we can reinterpret our culture and ways we represent it. I love these pieces because it gives me an opportunity to really explore some personal narratives, to think about ways in which uh, my story can relate to other people's stories as well. For example, in this piece, I have these uh, Six Flags cans. There were the can of sodas that you can get, that you can get a buy one, get one free ticket to Six Flags. And that was my family vac vacations growing up. We would go to Six Flags and we would all get up in the car and my dad would use his discount and my mom would make chicken so that we didn't have to pay park prices and we would eat her food and have these, our best way of making a vacation out of an easy trip from the city. It was always nice to get out of the city when we could. Continually, this is one of the larger works that I did. Back in 2018, I was working on this piece while at Queens College. Um, this piece, the cocinita, I really like it because it has a way of combining both this natural and fake. It's almost like a play on ideas. There are the real flowers that are printed on. There are the fake flowers that are painted and spray painted in. There are the real materials of flowers here, but there are also fake flowers. This combination of constantly trying to maintain what is real and fake, but also keeping it interior. What can you have in your, your very hot project apartment or your very steaming warm uh, place where you can't necessarily have all these plants? Even around the house, uh, around the gallery, you'll see a lot of fake plants going around. But continually, it's the idea of the table. Table where you come, the kitchen table. We have some memories here of like the home these uh, postcards from the 70s that I collected from my uh, parents' collection, 
even thinking about the laundry cart that you carry all your groceries and you're bringing it in. Um, continually this time, talking just a few minutes ago about how the time for me is like this warping time of, of, of thinking about how, the, how a place can hold on to such memory over time. Um, specifically thinking about how this house reference, uh, references my home of just for a year, but it was also my grandmother's apartment, it was my titi's apartment, it was my dad's apartment. We all crammed into this one space at some point in the Lower East Side of Manhattan um, and would go there. And so thinking about how these places can hold onto the memory, but then they're gone. They're rented spaces, never to really be seen again. No one owned them, no one had them. We can't pass them down in any sort of way. It's where the inspiration for a lot of my work came from is an opportunity to sort of archive these spaces and kind of keep their memories alive. And we'll so that was kind of our kitchen area and we'll move on over to the bathroom. <laughs> We have our bathroom area in this home. I've really used this Duck Street barn as an opportunity to really think about it as an entire home space. And so we have our restroom over here. Uh, pieces Ajax the Great, and this one is also called uh, Crimson Waves and Waterfalls. They're both references of what you can kind of peek into and get an understanding of, of somebody based on just their room or their bathroom. But even here, you'll have a lot of personal stories going on. This one is a very feminine kind of subject in which it has to do with period blood kind of peering down as you were washing your underwear when you were young and the shame that surrounded that. But also like kind of the colorfulness that comes with being a young girl and growing up and trying to navigate the world. Um, older references like Avon materials and of course you have to have all the Vicks because if you run out of Vicks that's going to be terrible because it's the cure all for everything. <laughs> and to be able to have these spaces where they give a little bit of an idea of who lives there. Even here, thinking about the two different size socks give you an idea of who, who's in this space. For me, it was my family. For others, a lot of people can recognize the children, uh, the guard rolls on the windows or the barbed wire and so on. Just ways in which we were kind of kept into our spaces but still use them as a way to express ourselves and our community and our culture. Continually, this one I've dedicated to my brother. I made a series of work that was based off of my home of 28 years in Queens. I've lived there for so long and I've seen it change over time. And I did a series based on the year around 1999 to 2000, which is when my family last sort of all lived in that space together. And in that I started thinking about all the different rooms and uh, what each one I could remember. There were not necessarily photos of everything, so what I can gather. This one specifically, there was not a photo of my brother's room. And so I had to think about what would be in my brother's room in 1999. Well, you got to know for sure any New York kid is going to have some uptowns for sure and maybe keep the boxes so we can keep them safe. You had your Jansport backpack, you had your uh, Nike fitted cap, and of course any Puerto Rican, if the parade's coming up, you got to be ready with your jersey and your fitted hat over there. It was just a sort of idea of thinking about the things we carried with us and the memory, but also, again, like who has a photo of your childhood room, maybe you do, maybe you don't, but being able to kind of carry that over. And I also had these additional pieces here, this one called Sprite No Ice, because that was what he would get order when he went to uh, a diner or so on. Um, thinking about the things that we keep, what's trash, what's real, what's, what's important, what we carry. When my parents all moved out, I had to continually consider all of the materials that they had. What do I keep? What do I hold on to? What's important? What should I remember? This was my childhood room. I didn't have a room per se. It was sort of a hallway that they made into a makeshift space. Um, when both doors were closed from the room here and from the room there, that was my little like privacy. I remember saying changing every time I had to change. For a while I had that there until my sister moved out, but it was a really funny and kind of interesting space to sort of drop off your materials and kind of think about what, what these areas were. When I was 10 years old, my family surprised me. For my 10th birthday, they painted the walls this like magenta color and they did this sky painting on the ceiling. My sister's very creative as well. And it was so nice for her, them to do that because they knew that I was in this like little kind of space. And I have to say now, my, my partner over here lives with four sisters and all of them have a bunch of different, all had to share a room. So I'm grateful to have my own space. However, um, it was very nice that they made it a special space for us and I had to acknowledge some of this. 
I have to also take a moment to acknowledge how wonderful it was to come into this area, into Duck Creek Farms, and see this like wooden old walls. And I had been painting all this wood and struggling to figure out the best way to do this wood. And so it's been really exciting to see what these kind of wood patterns would look like against these large, expansive wood walls. For a little bit more wood, we have this over here. This one is called Waterbed in the Attic. It's a really fun one. It's based on my sister's bedroom growing up. She had a waterbed. It was an attic. Why? God knows. I don't know. I, I still, to this day, wonder what if that thing had busted. And, this, and it would have messed up this really like dirty old rug that was there. And we can see her prom shoes in the corner. Maybe she would have needed them if it overflowed. Uh, I was talking earlier about how my mom would take the sheets that came from the bed set and make a matching um, a curtain set for that. I also do remember going to my sister's cabinet over here and sneaking in and reading her diary, which I definitely was not supposed to be doing. I don't know if she knows that, so she'll see in this video. <laughs> and then after that, we go from the bedrooms, we're starting kind of thinking of our living room area, which is the most open of our spaces. So over here, I started working with this uh, velvet frocking material, which was really fun to explore with and really represent this couch that my family had for so long. We had this couch in a Lower East Side apartment. Then my family tried to move to Florida and it didn't work out, but brought the couch over there. And then when it didn't work out and we came back to, to the city, we had that couch. And then when we moved to Queens and we were in there, I would just roll around this long couch that would go all around. It became such a huge marker of everything. I would stuff things inside. My brother and I would drink soda, way too much soda, out of spoons as we sat there and we drank. And there's some, such a good association I have. But also I think this piece, as it's called curved couches and, and tight corners, is about how you have to make the best of your space. Maybe the bike, the only way the bike is gonna fit in your house is behind your couch or next to the window in the radiator. Maybe you have to have a little bit of a memory of a lost space, like in Puerto Rico, this is my Titi's house there. Continually, I feel like those references happen. I added some uh, plants and hanging, uh, these like hanging plants over here, but continually thinking about how we uh, keep all of our memories alive. So this, this piece is really, was in my living room. We had uh, this large, once was a TV stand that lived in the Lower East Side apartment that moved to the Queens one and used to collect all the tchotchkes. I call it tokens for taking because after a while I didn't know what to do with all of these items or, or what to hold on to or what was important. I mean, even this like William from the Met was such an interesting thing that we didn't understand how it arrived in our place. And yet years later, when I had to become an artist and I even work in a museum, having such a strong relation to it. Uh, we even over here, I copied the handwriting very specifically <laughs> of my mother's, uh, of the tapes that we used to have. Of my, my sister's quinceanera, of uh, church events that we had. This was the photo box that my, my specific um, like baby photos were in. Um, thinking about the discontinued or maybe half full encyclopedias that you had a few of them. Maybe you had C through D, but then you didn't have the rest. A lot of these materials were really interesting because we sort of held on to them and they held meaning. It's not like we had like gold materials or things that were passed down. Although Puerto Ricans are from the United States, in some ways they are still migrating in ways and, you, and you're not really passing down so many items. And so what happens? What happens to these type of items, which my sister has actually. <laughs> I continually, I wanted to do a reference to my parents' room while working on that series. So I decided to reference a mirror that they had in front of their home, in front of their, um, in their bedroom. In it, they had on uh, one side was my mother's side, on the other side was my dad's, uh, marked by their chosen deodorant but also they had this uh, change collector in the middle. And it says what's his is hers and what's hers and hers. But there was no divider in the middle. It was just absolutely one full thing for change. And I always, as a kid, thought it was so funny to see and I just thought it was ironic. And now years later, as my parents are divorced, there was something a little bit extra <laughs> hilarious about that. But continually, when this piece first showed, my father, this referencing an idea from 20, 25 years ago, my father took out, out of his hand, a handkerchief and a comb exactly that size and proudly showed it up to everybody. <laughs> I'll continue on to this piece over here. I 
started working on some of these tapestry pieces, wanting to continue to go with this like large scale, but also uh, thinking again about that very large couch that had been moved around from place to place and, and lived with us and had so much history. And thinking also continually about the ways in which we have to cram things into spaces, but how do we keep the nature kind of coming in? So again, a reference to my Titi's apart, uh, home in, in Puerto Rico and thinking about this guido, which is actually a guido. It's an instrument that I have in the installation out on that side there. This was just a space we spent so much room and now it's my bedroom. It's so strange how rooms can change and transform and continue to grow. And it's been really nice to kind of reference them. These all reference the spaces that are real, but this is an interesting one that doesn't actually really reference the space that is fully real, only maybe one that kind of came to my mind. And I think it sort of comes off that way in that there's like a shadow and a shade. I call this one Maritza's birthday because my first name is Melissa and my mother said, thought one day that maybe I would be called Marissa, but didn't think that she liked the name Maritza and it was too similar. And I always wondered, what if I would be a Maritza, which is a classic Puerto Rican name, by the way. And so this was the idea of what was happening in her birthday? What would happen after a birthday party in the house where maybe there was a fire escape, which I didn't have, so it was always jello and stuff. So maybe Maritza had a fire escape. <laughs> maybe outside they had a family birthday and they were hanging out and the soda was left and the Malta drink was in the corner or the lipstick was left on the cup on the side. It was just this idea of thinking about, again, these pieces as portraits, these pieces as, as ways of expressing a, a person, but also of, of a gathering. Naturally, when you have this type of home spaces, they all are a place where we gather and we, we get together and we, we celebrate. So I started moving on even working on this table. It's called Gandules Gathering. It's about this idea of where we come together and where we eat, where we celebrate, where we play games. We made this mosaic table out of a found material, but used all of the mosaic pieces on here to sort of represent where you, the food that we eat, like the rice and beans, a Puerto Rican flag, represent. We, I even made some dominoes here out of resin and rice and beans and some sazon inside. All this idea that you can come and gather and celebrate and be in this space. The last piece that's shown is called Cherry Street. Cherry Street is actually an interesting place to end because it's actually where I was born. And although this couch had moved from place to place from Cherry Street and over to Queens and Elmhurst, um, it's also this just memory of thinking of what would be looking inside when you looked inside that apartment. I barely remember because I was younger, but now who lives in that apartment now? To be honest, I believe that somebody, that uh, those apartments were knocked down and turned into something else, and I have no memory and I have no association. This is our way of kind of archiving and thinking about it, thinking about how New Yorkans can sort of use the space that they have as a way to celebrate, as a way to acknowledge, a way that the Latinx community can continually be able to represent and build new communities wherever they land in the diaspora outside of their home countries. And even thinking about the way that everyone can reference. Italians and, and all different communities have been able to see my work and sort of find a sense of relevance. Be able to connect with the little materials that are on there and the, the collage and the painting and so on. They find themselves in it and I love that because all I'm trying to do is be, create a welcoming space. In a time where art can be so exclusive and you don't ever find yourself in that, it's been really helpful for me to kind of create spaces where people can feel welcomed and come on in and come into a place and feel like home. So come to Duck Creek, come and check it out. It will be open all month long and it will be here and you can catch me online as well. I'd like to ask a question. About, Please. Talk a little bit about the, um, the use of collage. Absolutely. Yeah, so my process generally starts, thank you for asking, I appreciate that. My process really can start from a few different ways. One of the things that I do is sometimes do some digital renderings where I illustrate something or use some images and try to figure it out. But a lot of time I start with a painting and then go in there with some collage materials. I like the idea of being able to create work and not feel stuck not to feel like I have any limitations. I think in a world where you feel constant limitations or everything, I like to let the art world be the world where I can explore. So maybe paint is of an essence, but maybe I need to collage something on top or maybe use like a plastic material 
or maybe some even tiles will find their way. Or maybe there's even a memory in this one here. On the very top, I have, uh, that's a piece from Puerto Rican bread. Every time I go to Puerto Rico, I save the bread and I bring it back with me and I even keep the paper rolls. And even when my mom or my family go, they like to bring back the bread. It's this idea of using whatever you have, using all the materials, experimenting as much as possible, and kind of creating this, this mishmash. It's almost as if our memory is how they operate. Sometimes things are in focus when you remember something, sometimes things are not. You don't remember all of it, or there's a time warp that has happened. But this is my kitchen. This is, my kitchen's painted now white, and there's different tiles, and we don't have that there. But this is what it looked like at some point. And so kind of being able to capture that using all of the different materials as possible. This is like a shiny oil. These are that laminate that you would put inside of those drawers themselves that you maybe you bought at a roll in the dollar store <laughs> and now repurposed and used in, in there. Even in that last one, you'll see that the collaging materials even led to, to really things that you can almost pull out. We have the napkins that are being able to pull out, the fake flowers and the clock, all just different ways of adding some life to them. They're almost true to life form, so I want you to be able to experience them, to sort of like walk into these rooms and be in there, be in there and share the space with me. Yeah. <laughs>